Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Q&A of Red Card um, with Mohammed Saeed Ohuma and uh, myself, uh, Dylan Valley. Um, just to introduce Mohammed briefly, um, uh, Mohammed is, of course, the director of Red Card and has, amongst other things, been a film programmer, film festival organizer, a journalist, and many, many other things. Um, and firstly, Mohammed, I just want to say kudos on a beautiful film and thank you so much for being part of Encounters um, in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. It's so nice to see you. Remember we met in Durban many, many years ago. That was uh, almost another century. So thank you and thank you to the Encounters team for selecting Red Card. Yes, yeah, we, that, it feels like a million years ago that, that, uh, we, that film festivals actually happened outside of um, our browser windows. Um, but we look forward to a future when that happens again. And it's also just great to reconnect in this way again and to, to have you be virtually in, feels like you're virtually in South Africa now, even though you're somewhere in France at the moment, if I'm, if I'm correct, right? Yes, I'm in Bordeaux. I'm, uh, the film is going to be shown next week, 23rd, for a um, festival called Afrique en Vision. It's part of uh, uh, the season called Africa 2020, and uh, I'll be doing a masterclass as well next week. It's going to be the, 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 the first public screening uh, uh, in France for that film. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to kick off the questions. I've got quite a few questions myself. We don't have a lot of time, so I won't get through all my questions before we get to the audience. But what I really want to start with is just by asking you, um, you know, what was it that really inspired you to make this film? What was the impetus for, uh, for Red Card? I mean, I didn't thought about making that film, to be honest with you, Dylan. I was thinking about uh, doing a follow-up to my uh, latest short fiction film. I was al already uh, already started developing the future, the the, the future with a, a, a playwright from Reunion Island, and then a friend of me called me, and then um, he was the manager of the football team of the Comoros, uh, during the Island Games in two thousand and fifteen. They were happening in Rainier Island, and he said, "Mohammed, when if you're around, can you can you just come with your camera and record some stuff for history?" So, I arrived there, and uh, the boycott happened. And then, between the moment that the the the, the, the athletes and the, the government of the Comoros boycotted the games, and the moment that they uh, they managed to get a plane to go back home three days, there was like a, a kind of a delay of three days. And I saw lots of athletes, you know, fleeing, you know, they didn't want to go back. And they were so frustrated because no one asked them about uh, um, what do they want to do? Do they want to, to follow a political conflict that has nothing to do? Because for most of them, they were not even born when that conflict up, uh, happened. So, and, um, I was like, almost like a, a, in a kind of provocative way, I've asked one of the girl, Razia in the film, are you going to flee? And she looked at me like say, uh, you crazy, why am I going to flee? I just came to play, I love my country. And uh, uh, you know, I'm just gonna go back. But I say, but you're not going to play. And she said, oh, you know what? Um, disappointment is part of a sports a woman's career, so I'm just going to go back, refocus, and try for next time. And uh, I say that's quite interesting because usually, you know, the, um, you know, when we're talking about the Comor, especially in our own, own region, Australia, uh, Africa, uh, we always talk about the conflict with Mayotte and the fact that people are fleeing to go to Mayotte because it's Europe, just like people are fleeing from Morocco to go to Spain, and uh, so. I thought it was interesting. So this young girl who has the possibility to maybe construct something else is saying, I'm going back and I'm going to stand still and I'm going to keep fighting. And I thought that was interesting. Maybe there was a film there. And I asked her, do you have other teammates who think like you? And she introduced me to Razia, to Asanati and Huluhu. And then just to make sure that I was sure if we were, they were my protagonists, 
I went with them in that flight with my camera. And then I didn't know how I'm going to go back to Reunion. So I just landed there with them and I started researching. So I met lots of athletes. And then uh, one of them told me that uh, it was a quite an interesting story. He told me that, uh, you know, in my village, you know, they gathered some money. He's playing basketball in France and they gathered some money and they wanted him to represent the village in the national team. And then he said, but my inspiration is this old man called Fundi Carnet. So he introduced me to the fourth character. And when I met him, I knew instinctively that he was going, he was going to be in the film as well. So basically, sometimes, you know, you do film, you're thinking about the film because it's a reflection. It's something that's really intimate, personal, but sometimes the story just comes to you. And then you have to grab it and you have to understand that what happened. That's really the impetus. Mm -hmm. Yes, I really love the characters. They, they all brought such a variety of experiences and tones to the film. I thought Fundi Carnet was, he really reminded me of the kind of characters you find in like a, a film like Buena Vista Social Club. It's like somebody who carries so much history with him, you know, one lifetime and, and so, um, so humble. Um, but has but is really a giant, you know, in terms of his his contribution to society, and I, I really love the way um, I think in the film you mentioned somewhere this idea of our staying is a form of resistance as well, and, and kind of how how you know just in through the acts of you know existing and and resisting through staying, um, they really make a difference in their society, right, in the country. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, this kind of, uh, this kind of relationship between these answers. So I remember when we did meet, you know, um, many moons ago um, at the film festival in Durban, you know, when you told me about reunion, for example, and how reunion is like, I guess what you would call a department of France and how it is, it, you know, it, you know, living there means that you are living in France, so to speak, in a way, right? And the same with my yacht. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that because I remember when we had that conversation back then, it really blew my mind because, you know, I'm gonna generalize about us South Africans a little bit now, but as South Africans, we generally don't know a lot about um, the colonial histories of other African countries. Um, and I found this to be like super fascinating in this kind of, and and, this complex kind of his, history because Mayotte also um, voted to to remain a department of France, right? Mm -hmm. So what what is the relationship like between these these islands and and um, obviously in the film we can see this, uh, like you say, a lot of people leave and and there's a lot of kind of migration between the two places and all the different places back and forth. I think, you know, historically speaking, I mean, uh, uh, France has been the powerhouse in those, within all those islands. When I'm talking about the Comoros, Archipelagos, Réunion, Mauritius, Madagascar, it's basically the superpowers. Probably they said, oh, this is French. This is French back garden, those small islands. They just leave that to France. There's no oil there yet. There's no gas. So they just focus on Congo, DRC, and <laughs> all the way we can extract more stuff. And it's going to be so basically the common link. There's a lot of common link, which is obviously the, the ex colonial language, which is the French. Uh, the, the, the French, and then you also have a common link, uh, which is um, those islands were stopovers for the slave trades. So basically what happened is, uh, you know, people were buying slaves in Zanzibar and then they were dropping them in the Comoros, so in Madagascar, in Mauritius, just to work on the sugar cane field. So that was also a common thing. So which means that you see the same population, even if you take the KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, mm. and then uh, you have some uh, people from India there that you can find in Mauritius or in Reunion, you know, because people were taking the to come and work in the sugar cane. When France lost uh, uh, Saint Domingo, they had to find other people. They had to find other places where they can produce the sugar cane. So we have this uh, slave trade as a common link, 
we have uh, the language and we also have, you know, humans, you know, they're trying to interact. So they move from places to other places. And the Comoros are known as the Doe country. So basically we are a, we are a population, we are a, 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 a nation of people who, tra who travel from one island to the others. And we go from, you know, Great Comoros to Anjouan, to Zanzibar, to Lamu, uh, you know, or to Madagascar or from Mauritius to Reunion. So basically we've been interconnected, but then because those societies have been built through the slave trade, through colonialism. So you have all those different, and kind of reminds of South Africa as well, because we have all those different, you know, the whiter you are when you're talking about skin color, a, the better your place in society is when you're looking at very, on a broad, on a, on a broader scale. And those racism or those things have been also entrenched with the way that people are interacting. And uh, you can feel like uh, uh, most of those islands, except for France and, uh, maybe, and maybe Mauritius and a little bit de Mayotte are quite poor. So I'm talking about the three islands of the Comoros and Madagascar. So it's almost like people are trying to go to Reunion or trying to go to Mayotte because that's Europe. Mm -hmm. So what you have to understand is Europe is that right there. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go all the way up. You can just, you know, because it's the same country. You're in Montjuan, you can see my yacht. And um, I've met, I've talked with some kids in Montjuan. They say, for us, it's fun to go to my yacht, like on a weekend. Even we're going to get expelled, but we just go there for a weekend, have fun. <laughs> and the cops are going, to, are going to, to kick us out and we come back. But when they're there, they, they speak the language. And, you know, they have the same culture, they eat the same food. So it's, a, it's almost like uh, uh, we're in a post-colonial situation that's very tangible. It's not like it's theoretical. It's not like it's mm. in books, but it's really tangible. When you're talking about the Comoros archipelagos, the post-colonial uh, problems are there, they're tangible, you can feel them, you can go to my yacht and see people getting expelled like by dozens every day. I've seen some crazy stuff like, you know, mothers dropping the kids, you know, out of the police car because they wanted the kid to have a chance to live in Europe. I've seen that from my own eyes. And like you having a coffee outside of the terrace and you see your mom getting stopped and then throwing his baby, wow. her baby. So you, it's, it's, it's real. So it's not like theoretical, it's like post-colonial problems are there and you can feel them. So which makes like maybe, so when you're creating from that point of view as an artist, it's very difficult to ignore that, that those post-colonial realities, because like I tried to say in the film, maybe implicitly it's like you always have like uh, maybe 60, 70 or 80% of the people are thinking about, let me go to Europe or let me flee because everything is falling apart. So the idea for you to just go out because everything is falling apart is just a normal idea because you're thinking, why am I going to stay in this? In this? It's too small. Everything is, nothing is working. So if I'm really realistic, I'll try my chance. So for example, I was teaching at the university uh, in the Comoros like a couple of years ago, and I had 114 students and I've asked them, uh, who wants to stay and build this country? Only mm -hmm. one raised his hand, only one. Wow. And those are kids from 20 to 25, 26. So when you have like all the youth who have one desire is to go, which is also you can replicate that in different countries in the continent, then you yeah. know you have a serious problem on the, in the country because who's going to build it? So for me, you know, the, 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 the challenge was to trying to find people who are staying because that's why you're saying for me, just by the simple fact of staying, of being resilient, it creates, maybe you can create some model. 
And that kind of model, I didn't want it to be superstars or people who are well known, but I think it's almost the same as in different countries on the continent. People who are staying are talking about and getting on with the daily lives, which doesn't seem very extraordinary in terms of story or whatever, but that's incredible, you know, uh, uh, situation to be with because everything is telling you, go. If you live in the commerce, your family, with, uh, with the family in France, the family in the States, are going to tell you, Dylan, just go, just come. And if you're going to screen your film outside, they're going to say, just come, just stay. Or you're going for a sports event, for a training, for mentorship, for whatever. People are just going to come to you and say, Dylan, just stay. Don't go back to Cape Town, just stay. And they're going to arrange everything for you. So how do you stay? Oh, no, I'm staying in my country. <laughs> I'm trying to build something there. So it's kind of a difficult situation. One of the things you also did in the film, um, you know, making the film was you, uh, which we spoke a little bit about before this call, was you, you mentioned how as part of this ideology that you're speaking about is you also really aim to use a crew entirely from this region and not, um, you know, and even though you had funding sources from all over the world, the first world countries, you were like, we want it, I want to use uh, people from this region. Um, can you say a little bit about that and how, how that worked out and, and, uh, and, everything, and the challenges of that and, and, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a challenge because I wanted to tell a story with a rhythm because in the islands we have a peculiar rhythm of doing things of uh, so uh, and also I wanted to say like okay we are isolated we are isolated we have uh, very few resources and skills but when we have them we have some really good skills when so I wanted to work with uh, my friends who are uh, also in the industry so my editor is from Madagascar he's also a great documentary filmmaker Antoniana Louva uh, is a great editor. The DOP is from Mauritius, uh, Azim Moulin. Um, the sound engineer is from Reunion Island, Ulrich. My AD is from Reunion. My, um, the other AD is from Comoros. And then I wanted to have, I wanted to have the skills from the area because it's important for me to show that, okay, we can do films. We can do it with our own rhythm. We can tell the story the way we want to tell. And because I've been, a, I had a past as a, a curator and as a festival manager, and I realized that uh, Mohammed, the challenge was also to say, uh, are the people in your country going to connect with that story? So I was asking myself that me and me and Luva, when we were editing, we're saying, are the Malagasy, are the Comoros people going to connect to that story? Because basically we don't have cinemas in the Comoros. So when I'm screening, so the film is doing the round of villages. So this is how we screen the films back home. So basically, are they going to understand what I'm trying to say? Are they going to get with that story? So for me, that was paramount. So I had a lot of, I wanted for that to be, to be that way because we have that rhythm. So for me, that's most important because I want to create something like a kind of body of work where people in my country can relate to. Before, I, I know it's great to, 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 to have this universal approach and be able to, 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 to make your film, but what's the point if your people in your country that you're filming <laughs> and that you're trying to tell the reality don't get connected to your film? So that was a real challenge. And that was a challenge even for funders because one of the character, Asanati, she's Ba, uh, and she's, uh, and she's, uh, um, she's a, a bodyguard. She's a, a sportswoman. So some people were like, why don't you just focus on her? She's an incredible character. She's bi, she's bodyguard, she's focused. She's an athlete, so that's, and she's Muslim. You see, I was ticking all the boxes with that character, you know, but that would have been very selfish because yes, I exposed that lady who gave me her trust. Then I do the round, get some awards, but then her life, especially in a country which is very Muslim is going to be messed up. So in terms of ethics, what do I do? 
And uh, so that was, and other, other people were telling me, oh, Fundi is very important. You know, like you said, you know, why did you focus on him? So it was like, no, it's the whole combination chemistry of all, because most of those girls were, were his pupils when uh, they were kids. So it's the chemistry between the four of them that it's interesting as well. So really that was uh, very difficult to make sure that people understood, understood what I was trying to say, me and my team. Yes, definitely. Um, and she, uh, I was actually gonna ask you about Hassan Nati because she's one of my favorite characters. Um, but I also wanna just remind the audience, uh, we actually almost running out of time, so please, ask your questions. Uh, we have one question from uh, Ketu Metze uh, asking, Mohammed, what, what has the reception of the film been like in the area? And has it met your anticipations and your expectations? Yes, thank you for that question because I was very nervous. We did, the, we did, we did a premiere, it far of course, but then after that, January 9th, we did the premiere in Moroni, and I was in an open air, and I was crazy because uh, uh, we have a very authoritative, almost dictatorial regime. So we wanted to do a screening, open air screening. So we set up the whole place in the afternoon, and then the military come at 5:30. <laughs> We're supposed to start the, shoot, the screening at seven, and they say get out and then we said we're going to do the screening they say we'll give you the authorization we said the the mayor we show our authorization and then they said no there won't be any screening covid we said well, we're taking all the distance and blah 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 they said just get out so it was like almost 6 p.m people were starting coming so fortunately there was a there was a space in front of us, so we managed to, to negotiate and we went into that venue. We rearranged the venue and we started with a bit late. So we did the screening, it was packed and it, it, uh, it was beyond my expectation, to be honest with you, because it was an incredible moment. And one, uh, one I will always remember, there's a, there's a guy who said, you know, thanks for allowing us to watch your fur, but Thanks for taking the time to have a public debate about our country, because you know, because this is uh, those spaces are very rare in the Comoros. We've been having a very, very authoritative regime for the last five years, and to just discuss freely and openly about how the country is going, and, you know, and this man, this old man, say this is very, this is a rare moment. And so it went beyond my expectations. And then Fundi was there, and I think he was waiting to watch the film because he passed away like two weeks later. So basically uh, he took after the film, people were questioning him, he gave his view, and then it really did, uh, it was a very touching and very important moment, even for the girls as well, because you know, they're a little bit shy and even in the, I lower my camera, so they managed to express themselves. And we starting doing screenings in the other islands. So it's really beyond my expectation because people in the country are going mad about the film. They want to screen it in different places. So um, yeah, it's a very good reception back home. And uh, that was one of the most beautiful moments in terms of my filmmaking career because you're making a film and the people that you're trying to make the film for are there and they're getting questions and they're getting remarks and everything. So that that really did uh, uh, respond to my expectation. That's great. Um, it's it's great that you're able to uh, you able to capture Fundi's story be, just before he passed away. I think that's so really important. I hope that his the project that he wanted to start somebody picks that up and and drives that forward um, in the schools. Um, and I've got another question from Tahir Saguro. He says, I thoroughly enjoyed the film and particularly how well paced it was. Are there any plans to revisit these characters in a follow-up film? They were so captivating on screen. Oh, Tahir, you know what? Because the girls at the end, they were fed up with me because it's observational. <laughs> <laughs> when they're like, hey, this guy is following us 
everywhere. <laughs> it's like, you know, because observational cinemas, you know, that and you just follow the characters. And at one point, because uh, I did some research and I was filming, doing some footage for like almost two years and a half. One point, Razia came up to me and said, man, you're just bullshitting. You're not gonna do this film. We fed up. We told our friends, family, that we're going to be in this film. And then I told her, that was like six months before the real shooting happened, say, we're coming with a team and I'm going ready to shoot in six months. And then when I arrived with my DOP, I'm saying, you're like, what? So, um, but they, you know, I don't think there'll be a follow up because the girls really have to thank them because it was four years of filming them. So, and it's difficult and they are incredible characters, but the thing to hear is like, we, we are friends now and we keep connected. They're, they're trying to know exactly what I'm doing. And then they are trying to know what they're doing. I've helped them with the club. And then, uh, so, Basically, this is why we make a film is to be connected with a, with a, a real life character. So, uh, but I don't think the girl will allow me to, <laughs> to put another camera for another three or four years in the life. Just four more years, just four more <laughs> years. <laughs> so uh, we're almost out of time, but I'll just, I'm going to have one more question here from, uh, from Anonymous, who, and I think you might have answered this in a way, but um, so you mentioned how you really started a dialogue in your country and you definitely, you wanted to speak to, uh, you know, you wanted to speak to the country specifically and people, you know, from the, from the region that you were filming. And, but was there a specific message that you were trying to drive home? Which is what Anonymous was asking. And do you feel that, that if there was a specific message that it was uh, received and interpreted in the way that you you wanted uh yeah i mean the for me the message is uh, is really of hope because i think like i said at the last in the last seconds of the film that uh, i think those four characters uh make it possible for us to be collective and to be to play uh, you know much more with solidarity so maybe our country will see a better future so I think that's uh, for me uh, the underlying tone is a positive tone. Even what I'm what I'm showing is uh, can be interpreted as negative, but I follow those because for me they are they are like uh, our daily heroes. In a, even in South Africa, you have your daily heroes. People were making sure that the social fabric, uh, the tissue of the society, keeps tickling and keeps going forward. And I think uh, for me as a filmmaker, those people as a documentary filmmakers are really interesting, are of big interest for me. So for me, that message was like, can you recognize that in our societies, in our uh, a very poor and very isolated country, we have people that are making sure we are not completely drawn, that we are we're keeping, that we're keeping going. And I think it's a message that's particularly relevant in these days and times. So for me, that's really the message I wanted to, to pass on really. And I think if people manage to get that, then I think my message is going through because those people, those girls and this man who passed away, unfortunately, they are positive people. You know, despite all of what um, showing they are very positive people and I think it's a message that's for me is important uh, we it's not spectacular uh, uh, but how do you construct a country with only spectacular and everything you need like you need really people who are positive and you know after setbacks of setbacks they come back at it so and the living a trace and the living something in them in the minds and spirit of people and uh, they are role models Razi, i know you talk about asanati she's a real hero there she's a real role model for a lot of women and young girls in the Comoros. and i've realized that by filming her by following her for many many months and years so uh, and those people if they keep going i think maybe we have a brighter future ahead Yes, thank, thank you so much. And it's so true. We all have that responsibility to be those everyday, you know, heroes in our communities. And by just, by just, you know, being a positive energy, being a positive force 
and building our countries and going forward, you know, getting over the, the impacts of colonialism and extraction in our lives and now, you know, neoliberal capitalism. But I just want to say one more time, thank you so much, uh, Mohammed, for this. I really enjoyed the film and I can tell by the questions it's really, it's really hit, um, resonated with us here in South Africa as well. And um, I'm really looking forward to what you do next. So I think uh, that's the end. I think we seem to, I think we've, oh, sorry, you froze there for a second. Yeah. Uh, so thanks very much. And Thank yes, you. we'll be looking forward to what you do next. Yes. And um, keep us posted. And if you want to, if we want to follow you, uh, your work, where can we do that to see what you're up to? And oh, what? on my social media, you can follow me on FB, Mohammed Sayduma, and that's it. It's quite simple. I'm not really a social media person, but you can follow. I try to keep track. <laughs> I'm yes. not on TikTok, but I'm on Instagram and, uh, and <laughs> It's all TikTok these days. We all just exactly. I'll try to be on TikTok for <laughs> next time. <laughs> Yeah, you have to dance your way through the next one. <laughs> exactly. Do a dance exactly. There was a question I want to answer quickly. It was about the wheelchair people. Oh, they're, yes. They're, yeah, they are really disabled. They are, and they are great because uh, every week they go and practice basketball and they, as well, they keep, they keep going as well. Okay. So thanks everybody for the questions. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you once again, Mohammed. Thank you. Um, Thank you and hope hope we Love see you see again you soon physically. Thank you, Tarin. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Mandisa, and everybody who's watched the film. <laughs>